Welcome. This is the Lifetime Cash Flow through Real Estate Investing Podcast. This is where you'll learn strategies to help you achieve lifetime financial freedom through real estate investment. Your host, Rod Cleef, has owned over 2,000 homes and apartments, and he brings experts in all aspects of real estate investment and management onto the show. Now, here's your host, Rod Cleef. So I want to ask a favor of you guys. If any of you listening have purchased a multifamily property as a result of things you've learned or maybe been inspired by in this podcast, please email me at rod at rodcleef.com and tell me about it. It's R-O-D at R-O-D-K-H-L-E-I-F.com. You know, tell me about your deals. I can't tell you how much pleasure I get when I get those emails and have conversations with you guys about, you know, the fact that you took action and you've got your first property or your second property. So please give me that gift, you know, when you do take action and buy a property. Again, it's rod at rodcleef.com. I also want to mention that we have some partnership opportunities coming up. We're, we're actively buying small apartment buildings and even mobile home parks right now. And I'm always looking for people to partner with me. So if you have an interest in potentially partnering together on a deal, you know, shoot me an email. That email would be partner at lifetimecashflowacademy.com. I know that's a lot. Partner at lifetimecashflowacademy.com. Yeah, we're, we're kicking butt right now. We've got a lot of activity happening. So if you have an interest in potentially partnering with me on some deals and looking over my shoulder as we, you know, do them together, send me an email. Now, it's an autoresponder email, so almost immediately you'll get an email back from us that has a link to our calendar. And this is a link to set up a call with us to discuss partnering with us. So either myself or my partner, Robert, will get on the phone with you and go into more detail about what we're doing and how we might work together. So again, that's partner at lifetimecashflowacademy.com. And last and certainly not least, I don't know if you've heard, but we've had over a million downloads and I just, I am so grateful to you guys for your amazing support. Over the last eight months or so, I've spoken with or communicated with literally about a thousand of you and I can honestly say it's, it's been an incredible joy for me. So, now we'll say this, so many of you that I spoke with asked me for coaching or mentoring or asked me to create a course or training materials and I really never planned to do that when I started this podcast. After I heard it over and over again, I just finally decided to go ahead and do it. And I hope that those of you who have read my book know that I don't do anything halfway. So I'm excited to say within a few weeks, I'll be launching what I can humbly say is the best multifamily training and coaching program available anywhere. And I've carefully designed this program to include comprehensive online course, uh, weekly coaching that comes with it, accountability, motivation, you know, an online members area where you can communicate with your, with your peers and strategize on deals together, tickets to a live event. And we've packed it with a lot of other tools and resources. And it's basically designed to really help you quickly crush it in this business to, to help you build lifetime cash flow as quickly as possible. Now, if you want to get some more information on this when it becomes available, because it's, it's still a couple, two, three weeks out, if you want to get some more information, text the word CRUSH, C-R-U-S-H, to 41411. All right, let's get to it. Welcome to another edition of How to Build Lifetime Cash Flow. I'm Rod Cleef, and I'm thrilled you're here. And I know you're going to enjoy the gentleman we're interviewing today. Uh, his name is uh, Jared Sturm. And he's in Atlanta, and he's got a very interesting story. Started young, but I think he's going to really relate to a lot of you guys because he didn't start with an MBA or come from a lot of money. He did it the hard way and I think the inspiring way. So, Jared, welcome on the show, buddy. We're anxious to hear about your story. Thank you. I was excited to join the show. I think we uh, align a lot on our different uh, beliefs in multifamily and uh, cash flow and all the things that you you preach. I've listened to a lot of your shows. So, oh, thank you. I didn't know that. Thank you. Yeah, happy to join and uh, happy to share our story. Awesome, awesome. Well, tell us when you got started in real estate. I've got a little taste of it, but let's just pretend I don't know anything and tell my listeners. Yeah. Um, well, if we go back all the way till '06, which would put me at uh, 16 years old, I would I would label that as <laughs> my start and. Uh, my start into real estate was working as a handyman for a local real estate investor who did buy and hold. So I worked on his properties and uh, I admire him. He's a great guy. He was, he was a good mentor, but he taught me a lot of how not to uh, manage properties and what type of properties I didn't want to buy. So he did a lot of 
uh, subsidized, very low income, single family houses. Um, so I was doing the maintenance on those. Section eight. Yeah, mostly. Yeah. yeah. And, and this is in Cincinnati. So um, section eight in Cincinnati, but uh, took that knowledge and work with him. And whenever he would ask, do you know how to fix this or fix that? I would answer yes. And then I would figure it out along the way. And that uh, helped me gain some experience and kind of went from being his trash out guy, hang up blinds to starting to do bigger projects. And by the time I was about um, 18, I was doing full flips for him and uh, running that stuff. So uh, two years of building the knowledge under his portfolio. And then at about 18, uh, myself and my brother, who's currently my business partner still, uh, decided we wanted to buy a house and use those skills. So uh, with a little bit of money we had saved up and the uh, co-signing from the parents, we purchased a four bedroom house that then we converted into a six bedroom and rented out rooms to friends. So uh, kind of broke it up and the, uh, I remember it's a funny story. I remember the closing for that house conflicted with high school graduation. So we had to move it slightly. So um, oh, you couldn't get them to move the graduation. No. Hey, I want to interject something that's awesome because I just did a clip on acting as if and you absolutely acted as if when the guy asked you if you knew how to do something and you just did it. So that's a clue for you guys listening. You know, sometimes you got to fake it till you make it. So that's awesome. So anyway, I assume you graduated and you closed on the house. Yes. Yeah, I walked in, I closed on the house and and uh, the reason we bought that house is it had a, a very large detached garage. And myself and my brother wanted to go into the trade. So we wanted to start a construction company. Over those few years of working for this local real estate investor, we had friends and family reach out and say, hey, I'm looking to upgrade this bathroom or can you do this project, that project. And so at 18, uh, so 2008, we left working for that gentleman and, and went out on our own starting a small construction company. Well, that grew very quickly through word of mouth. Um, and we ended up doing high-end kitchens, bathrooms, and additions for all kinds of people. Um, and it was good. It was very profitable. We enjoyed it. But what Perfect, we perfect timing, by the way, because if you'd have been investing, then uh, you'd have gotten your butt handed to you like the person you're talking to right now. So good for you. You were in construction. People weren't buying as much, but they were still fixing stuff. So you flourished. That's awesome. Right. And I think a lot of the guys who were uh, established in the construction industry were licking their wounds at that point and we were coming in with zero overhead oh good in such a small company that we could we could pick up those jobs and so that's what i attribute our growth to and mm. we did really well and i enjoyed it for the time we did it but we realized in 2011 hey if we're doing this for other people why can't we do it for ourselves and so that's when we started to look at these properties and uh at that time 2011 i was graduating college so i went through college running this construction company Graduated college and hit the ground running straight out of college, didn't go get a job, just went full-time real estate. Um, so some of the funds we had saved through doing the construction company allowed us to buy highly distressed single family homes where we used our skills and contracting to uh, offset our lack of capital. So back then I was 21 years old, didn't have a W-2 job, didn't have experience. So rightfully so, no one would lend to us. And so the first eight, we actually had to do all cash. And, um, and uh, just for your listeners, this is in Cincinnati, Ohio in 2011. So price points were pretty low. And we were buying literally the, the, mo the worst house on the street because we didn't have that much money, but we had our skill set. So we were substituting our, our skills and our uh, hustle for our lack of capital. And that's what we did for the first eight. And, that, and at that time, we were still doing side jobs for construction and making some money. But all the money coming off of these investments were getting dumped back into the next one. Uh, now we grew that and to kind of- So you were flipping them though. You were buying them, renovating and flipping them. No, no. Actually, no. We, uh, we kind of, we took the inverse of the normal approach. We were buying cash and holding them and renting them out. Oh, good for you. But they were free and clear. So you were cash flowing well. Cash flowing well, but all that cash flow is going into renovating or purchasing the next one. That's and, awesome. And after eight uh, properties free and clear, we found a portfolio lender that was willing to do a blanket cash out refinance. And that's really what kicked off the compounding effect of our growth. And we took that money and we had it, we had, you know, eight more houses in four months. And uh, 
built up the portfolio that way, just doing buying them cash, renovating cash out, refinance, and on to the next one. And uh, realized that we can accelerate our growth by getting into multifamily. So we started in single family and we liked it there, but we always realized the potential that multifamily had. So uh, we eventually made it from single families into multifamilies with our most recent purchase um, of a multi-million dollar 42 unit in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, And we did all of this uh, not through having an outside job, but just by using the power of compounding and the benefits that real estate has given us to get to that point. Let's talk about, first of all, the power of compounding. What does that mean to you? Well, I think I always tell people that my biggest asset that I have is that I realized um, that I wanted to be a real estate investor and I realized the benefit of time at a young age. So um, I can let time do its thing. And what I mean by that is um, I can roll, I can let real estate do what it's good at and build wealth. And sometimes that takes a decent amount of time. So if you're getting started and you only have five years till retirement, that puts you in a tough spot where you may have to be a little more aggressive where we started at um, 21. So I have 30, 40, 50 years where I can let um, amortization take over and let it build up my wealth over time. And I can use that to then accelerate growth later down the road. And, and really, it's a snowball effect. So, so you, you're basically talking about the, the value of time in, in, as it relates to your age and your ability to utilize that to, to maximize your real estate, which is exactly why I got into the business. And funny, I want to interject a story. And I, I wrote about this in my book, but basically that I remember an old guy in Denver that I was trying to buy his apartment complex. He had all kinds of free and clear apartments. And he told me something once that stuck with me my whole life. And that was, you know, I told him I wanted to get into it. And all of his were free and clear. He was an old, funny old guy. And he sat me down. He said, if you do what you're thinking of doing, you're going to have buckets of money. And uh, that, that phrase always stuck with me. And, and you're absolutely right. I mean, good Lord, at your age, in 30 years, everything you have will be free and clear. And uh, it doesn't get any better than that. So good for you. So let's talk about that 42 unit. You went from houses to 42 units, or did you have some duplexes or some 10 units or anything smaller in between? We did have some duplexes. We bought a five unit. Uh, well, okay. we bought it as a four and then converted it to a five and submetered the utilities to right. value sure from four to five. And then, so we, we understood the process of multifamily and, and valuation and how to add value. And that's probably why we, why we wanted to get into multifamily at a bigger scale. And so we found this 42 unit and, uh, and, and purchased that in June of 16. Okay. So, so you progressed from the single family to the to small multifamily, which is a very normal, natural progression. You know, you've got to build that risk threshold, that risk muscle, which is really what it is. It's a muscle and you've got to, you've got to work it to, to move. A lot of people do. Some people, they'll go right for the 80 or 100 unit. They'll syndicate right out of the gate. Those are the Trump Trumps of the world, I think. But normal people like you and I, we start small. And, you know, when you were talking about renovating those trashy houses in Cincinnati. Boy, that brought back memories for me in Denver, let me tell you. You could buy whole blocks for eighteen, twenty thousand a piece in areas that now have gentrified that are three, four hundred thousand dollar houses. It's just astounding what's happened there. But but good for you. So so you you did a forty two unit. Let's dissect that one. Do you mind if we do that? Yeah. No, oh. I uh, I'd love to. I can start with uh, we spent probably three months looking for this deal. So we had uh, So how'd you look? Let's start there. Um, well, what I did was I knew it'd be difficult to break into the multifamily space the way the market is. It's difficult to get brokers to take you serious or, or owners. So what I did was, um, I started out and I was like, I'm going to call, I forget what it was, 25 or 50 owners or brokers a day. And I would, I burn out. And so what I did was I paired it back and I said, five a day, I'm going to build this Excel spreadsheet five brokers, five owners. And what I did is I either went to the tax assessor website or I just went on to different um, commercial real estate listing sites and got brokers names and numbers. And then I just circled back through every day I had to call five and uh, I would call them and say, Hey, I just want to remind you of what we're looking for here. If you have anything, love to come take a look. I'm local so I can come out and walk through it, remind them of our background in construction so we can move quickly doing it with our own funds, yada, yada. And uh, after about three months of that, I called one of the highest 
uh, quantity or highest uh, sales quantity brokers for multifamily in the Cincinnati region and just reminded him. And he said, you know what? Actually, one I had under contract is about to fall out tomorrow that fits what you need. And I said, well, let's go. I'll, I'll meet you there when you're ready. And uh, so we met over there and it just happened to line up that I called him on the right day that it was going to fall out and reminded him this is what we were looking for because I was not on the top of his list. He has oh, buyers, sure. buyers that can swipe a check and pay for these things cash. So let, okay, let me inter- just interject something. And guys, I hope you just, there were, there were a couple of big clues in what he just said. One, I know you've heard me say it ad nauseum. You've got to be willing to do what other people aren't willing to do. And most people will go in LoopNet and look for a listing. And Jared got on the phone and five a day, even five sellers and five brokers, it's not that big a deal. I mean, really, when you get right down to it, I'll bet if you look back on it, you didn't spend more than a couple hours a day at it, if that. And, you know, it feels like it's a lot, but it's really not. And, but, but you did what most people won't do. And, and the other big clue there is the consistency in the follow-up, okay? Because, you know, I tell people, you know, these, and, and I've interviewed brokers on the show, and they aren't going to take you seriously the first time. And, and you, you, you've got to follow up. And if they send you a listing, make sure you respond, even if you're not interested and say, no, this doesn't meet our criteria, or, but always respond. Most brokers, they send a listing and it becomes a black hole. And if you're the guy that is responsive and in front of them all the time and, and you catch them at the right time, like you did, Jared, I mean, that's how it came together. That's awesome. And that's, that's a great, great for my listeners to hear that. So let's talk about that specific specific deal. So, 42 units, C-class, B-class, what uh, what sort of an area? Let's talk about the actual building. I buildings. was C-plus, um, but that's okay. all relative, so I'll help describe that. So, okay. uh, it was built in 1990, all brick exteriors, pitched roofs. Um, the median household income for the area is about 45000 So, I'll have some people label that as B-minus and some people label it as C-plus, but that should give your listeners a good idea of what we're working with. Um, the, to kind of add to what you said about, uh, qualifying yourself to the broker and being difficult as a new, new person, when we, did, when we did get this deal under contract, one of the things that me and my partners talked about is said, this is one of the brokers who does the most quantity in our area of multifamily. Everyone knows his name. We have to perform to the best of our abilities. And now since we've closed that deal, I have on our credibility package that I send out with our offers a quote with his name that says, you know, SNS Capital Group, our company, performed and closed the deal for a great transaction and his name underneath. And I asked him for approval of that quote. And now his name, his credibility carries into our company. So that, that gives you an idea of another value. that we No, have. that's fantastic. And guys, what he's just talking about is something you absolutely need to develop as you get into this business is a credibility package. And what a great tip to get broker to to give you a quote, a testimonial, just like I get for my course and coaching and whatnot, you get a testimonial and it just adds credibility. It gives gives you social proof and to get the the top broker in the area, fantastic uh, move on your part, Jared. That's awesome. And I tell you guys, sometimes when you're buying that first unit and you had cash on hand, you, I know you took this thing down yourself and I want to dig into it a little more. But bef- before I do, I want to mention that sometimes you have to use a sponsor until you can build your own credibility package. You have to bring somebody in that, that maybe owns units like that in the area or you know has the financial strength that you don't have. You bring them on the team and sometimes you have to do that to get started. And then you use that to build your credibility package. But that's like your business card in this business when you're talking to brokers brokers, lenders, and everything, just to show them what you're about, what you've done, and, and you, you obviously make yourself look as good as you can, and, and, you, and you really need that. So, that's awesome. So, can we talk numbers? What, uh, what were they asking? What did you end up getting it for? A unit mix, all of that? Mm-hmm. So, it's 42 units. It's all uh, two bedroom, two bath, about uh, 1,100 square foot. Per oh, nice. And um, they're all identical floor plans, which we like because we self-manage and we have different uh, operations that are repeatable when the units are exactly. Oh, sure. Uh, that makes life a lot easier and maintenance, everything makes it a ton yeah. easier. Yeah. Yeah. But, to, but to, to jump back a little bit, when we first viewed that property, uh, we immediately saw ways to add value. It was marketed as stabilized, but we saw opportunities with our background in construction and our background in management that I think other people were missing because it was marketed as stabilized. So, well, uh, do tell. Yeah, I, I'd love to elaborate on that. So, yeah. when we went through the unit, immediately, like 
we're very good at electrical and plumbing and things like that in the trades. Um, so immediately we realized that we could cut the pipe and install a water submeter very easily. So we ended up doing that at a cost of about $200 per unit. Oh, that's really cheap, by the way, for you guys listening. That's really cheap. Good for you. So this, the previous owner was um, paying $29,000 a year for the water bill, uh, which now with the, with this, you know, a $200 per door improvement, we were able to uh, slash $29,000 off of our expenses and, and boost our net operating income. And the great thing about submetering water that we found by talking to other investors and through our own practice is you, you decrease your expenses X as the landlord, but you only increase your residence expenses 70% of X because consumption goes down by 30% when they are responsible for the water. Yep. So it's, it's less of a burden to the resident when, uh, than just raising rents because it's, you know, dollar for dollar in that equation. Um, but to take it one step further on the submetering, we realized that opportunity, but we also realized that the previous owner, there's washer and dryer hookups in each apartment unit. Um, the previous owner said, no, I don't do anything with washer and dryer because they'll run a load. The residents will run a load with one sock in it and it will cost me a fortune because I pay the water. Well, we said, okay, well, there goes, there's opens up the other opportunity, which um, now we can rent washer and dryer units to each resident for an additional fee. And that would- Oh, so you rent them. You didn't just throw them in and let them use them. You actually rent them. Good for you. Yeah, we rent them with a separate fee. It's $40 a month, which then that removes the, the cost and puts the cost of water onto them because they're paying for the water now that it's submetered, which- so there, there was opportunity one was submeter opportunity, right. opportunity because of that was washer and dryer. And then opportunity three exposed itself during due diligence. So during due diligence, I personally walked each unit and interviewed each resident. And one of the questions I asked is if, if, if we could do anything to improve your living experience here, what would it be? And the, the I got it over and over was more storage. Surprisingly at 1100 square foot units, they wanted more storage. Hmm. So what we did was there was common area laundry rooms in each building. Oh, perfect. So we said, well, now that we're submetered and providing washers and dryers, we can remove the coin laundry and build storage units and rent those out separately. So they have, they have the option to rent a washer and dryer and storage unit. And I'm happy to say those are filled and renting. So all of these minor tweaks are able to uh, boost our net operating income enough that we'll be able to refinance and pull 100% of our initial investment back out in two years. All right, and, well, hold on. Let, let, just, just for my listeners, what do you calculate your total NOI improvement to be? And then, I, and, then, and then what cap rate do you think that place would trade at right now? I want you to, I want you to tell my listeners, yeah. first of all, what the NOI improvement was, and then tell them what that, how, how, how hugely that impacted your, your value. Yeah, so the water bill was the majority of it. Of course. But we had we expected a boost of about thirty four to thirty five thousand, and at an eight cap, I think that's um, it was around four hundred thousand. Okay, guys. Okay, let me stop. Did you hear that? All he did was bill back the water, and he got a or well, the big thing was the the water, and you got a four hundred thousand dollar boost in value. That's yeah. why I'm excited about this industry. That's why we do this, and. You know, even if you didn't have the construction background, those of you listening, and you buy a 30 or 40 unit, and you're not going to actually individually meter them, you can institute something called RUBS, a ratio utility billing system, where you actually bill the water back uh, pro rata to the tenants. Now, that's not the ideal situation, but the ideal is to actually separately meter it. But any improvement you make to the net operating income exponentially uh, increases the value. And here's a fantastic example. Well, good for you, buddy. That is that is very inspiring. So you're going to refi it and move on to the next one, right? So we actually um, something to jump before we jump to financing. I'd like to sure. point out to your listeners because I think it's important. It's a great story, but in our analysis and underwriting, we're holding rents stagnant for the first three years. So we are not increasing rents because we have done this water. So mark rents were slightly below market, but because we we're increasing our cost to our residents. We have to take into account that sure. we're not paying more, um, and so 
in our underwriting, we're making sure that we're not overdoing it and losing residents. I'm happy to say we've already began billing back and we did not lose anyone. Um, we gave them plenty of notice. We actually installed the meters for future reference. We installed the meters and then watched consumption and then started billing back and then watched consumption after that to make, get a better understanding of how much that changed. Oh, was, that's great data. Yeah. Wow, that's great. What did you find? That's, that's good for you. That's, I, I'm dying to hear what the improvement was. Well, it was about a 30% decrease in consumption. Wow. And, and to give wow. you an idea, that's, that's because now they're more... Uh, well, sure. They, they're paying the bill. They, they, I mean, duh. You know, they're, that, I mean, that's like if you provide heat, they leave the windows open. You know, it's, it's the same dynamic, 30%. Wow, that's significant. Oh, that, yeah. I'm really glad you did that. That's that's fascinating information to have. So you closed on this thing, and I know that now you're uh, you're exploring syndication. You mentioned that to me before we started recording. So uh, t- t- tell me what's next. Um, well, syndication of larger deals. So what we're looking at right now is uh, 60 units or greater uh, apartment complexes in uh, median household income areas of $45,000 or more in a price range of two to 10 million. And, and we hover in that range, not because of lack of capital, but because under two, we seem to be competing with um, high income dentist attorneys, doctors who are buying for tax purposes, and we can't justify those the, the, the dollar amounts that they're paying. And then over 10, we're competing with institutional buyers that are uh, have bottomless pockets at this point and are bidding things up. So what markets are you looking at? Are you in, are you in first tier markets? Or are you looking in secondary markets and tertiary cities? We are looking in uh, MSAs as well as the secondary markets around them. Now mm-hmm. we're very specific to Atlanta, Georgia, as well as Cincinnati, Ohio. And the reason being is because we have, um, there's three partners in our company and we have at least one owner in those uh, MSAs that could drive it for diligent, diligent asset management as well as property management since we're doing it ourselves and self-managing. But um, I would love to jump back to the 42 unit financing if you're- Oh, no, please, 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 please. Yeah. Okay. Because I know that's a big hurdle, right? For a lot of your listeners are getting- Sure. A big hurdle. Like the day we closed, they lent us, I think, one point, uh, 1.8 million roughly. And I, I couldn't believe it. You know, I was sitting there like someone lent us 1.8 million. That's, I, I couldn't fathom it. So um, what we did was we built a relationship with a poor, small local portfolio lender as we were growing through single family houses. So we built that track record with them. And I tried everything to add value to that, com- to that bank as we grew. Um, so I started a local meetup that we hosted at that. Uh, oh, nice. So I would drum up business for them that way. I would constantly recommend them. I moved our accounts over to their bank to help them with deposit um, uh, deposits that they need. And um, so I did everything I could to build a good relationship. And even when we closed deals, I would send them thank you letters or, you know, uh, an edible arrangements and things like that. That's the bank that gave us the loan. And I will tell you that um, it was very hard to get 80% LTV. They did not want to go to that. They said, no, this is your first large one. We do 75. We never go to 80. We never go to 80. And I'm saying I have to get 80 or I'm going to another bank. And what I ended up coming up with that worked out really well was um, I knew they needed deposits. So I said, well, the difference between 75 LTV and 80 LTV is a hundred thousand dollars. What if I take a hundred thousand dollars if, if you give me ADL TV, I will take $100,000 and put it into a six month CD at your bank. That way you get your deposits. You can go lend out that hundred thousand dollars. And in six months I get it back. So I'm not locked in and they agreed to it. The board agreed to it and we got our ADL TV. So- wow. Wow. Good for you, buddy. Listen, I, I want to, I want to, I again, put it, put, put an oomph and an emphasis on several of the things you just said, because guys, those of you listening, this is a relationship business. It's not this faceless bank he's dealing with. It was people. And my hat's off to you. Sending thank you notes, huge. Sending an edible arrangement when you close a deal, huge. Taking them to lunch, having a cup of coffee, then directing people to do deposits there, having meetups there, brilliant. I hope you guys are taking notes. This is brilliant. And because we're in a relationship business, I mean, truly. And that's why, you know, the phone calls to the brokers, staying on top of it with the lenders, all very, very great feedback here for you guys that are listening. And, and I hope you're taking notes. Like I said, this is, 
absolutely fantastic way to build yourself in this business because it's a people business. Good job, Jared. I'm really glad we circled back on that. That was great value you just added. So, so you're syndicating, you're uh, looking at, you know, only, only feedback I'd give you, I, I, the 45,000 price on homes, I would go a little higher, but that's just me personally. Um, but, you know, you know that market, so I'll, I'll leave that alone. But It's actually, we're targeting a median household income of 45000 Oh, 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 I thought it was house value. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't hear you. Oh, no, that's, that's perfect. I, I'm sorry. I, I heard something else. No, you're absolutely right. No, that's perfect. Good, 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 good. Yeah, I, I, was, I thought you were talking about home values, and I was going to say, you know, I, I like to use eighty grand, but um, okay, good. I misunderstood you. So, Atlanta, Cincinnati, and what was the other one? That's it. Was, yeah. That was it. That was it. Okay. Secondary markets around those. Right, um, right, 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 right. So, so, what advice will you give? You know, a lot of the people listening to this show haven't taken the plunge and bought their first property yet. Mm-hmm. What would you tell them? Well, I know you, on your show, you, you preach uh, buy and hold. And mm-hmm. I, I agree with you. And I will tell you that Buy and hold long-term real estate investment is very forgiving even to mistakes. So I've bought houses that um, maybe now I wouldn't have bought, but they ended up being great. So um, the most important thing is, is getting your foot in the door, getting started. I will tell all the listeners that we've had tremendous success and I'm very thankful for it. But in the beginning, we didn't know what we were doing. It was just, we knew how to work on houses. That was it. And right. so we were buying houses because we knew how to, uh, you know, fix some plumbing and electric. But as far as real estate investment, I didn't understand it. So I learned along the way. And that has been our biggest attribute is being able to take the risk and learn along the way. And I would just tell your listeners is sometimes you have to throw yourself into the fire. And I even remind myself today, like right now we're in highest and best on a $4 million deal. And I, I sometimes I think I, I know too much now and I overthink it. And I say, remember, you kind of, once you get thrown in that fire, we always end up doing really, really well. And so sometimes you have to just make the jump. Mm. And guys, what, what he's talking about, uh, he said highest and best. Uh, the market is so hot right now that most properties are getting multiple offers. And so what the sellers will do or the brokers will do is they'll ask everybody that's made an offer to give their highest and best offer. I don't like those situations because you're, you're bidding against yourself and, and uh, you know, that's, uh, that's not a fun place to be, but you got to do what you got to do if, you, if you're going to, you know, be buying the, the bigger properties today. So tell me about your team. Like, like you've got, you said you had, was it a total of three partners? Your brother was one of them and there's someone else? Is Actually, that right? There's three total on our, okay. on our, in our group. So, do, you, do you have complementing skill sets or, you know, t- talk about your whole team. T- t- yeah. You know, so my listeners, if they're going to get in this business, they know who they're going to need. Yeah, I would love to because uh, I think that's where a lot of our success comes from. On my own, I would probably only be at 1% of what we're at as a whole. So uh, I can go into my my background is in construction, but my formal education is sales and marketing. So within our syndication business model, I raise the debt and equity. So I, I do the relationships. I raise the money. I make sure our face and our name of our company is out there. My brother, who's my business partner, his background's in construction as well, but his formal education is real estate economics. So he has his degree in real estate economics. He looks at, he does the acquisition side. He also has his license in Georgia and Ohio. So um, he does, deals with the brokers, looks at different markets, does the analysis. Now our third partner, um, he has a master's degree in accounting. He's a CPA. He's worked for big four firms doing financial auditing. And now he currently works for a Um, I think a a multi-billion dollar, I think it's $8 billion real estate firm where he does uh, their reporting to their private investors as well as the SEC. So he brings that skill set into our company. He takes on the asset management role within our syndication business model. So we we complement ourselves very well. So we're very different on our skill sets. But the the thing that's really important is we're very similar on our long-term goals and uh, what we're trying to achieve and how we view money, um, putting it back into the company, growth, not needing it now, things like that. So we we align on those, but we differentiate on skill sets. And I it sounds that. like sounds like your brother and the other partner are both um, super analytical. Uh, you know, they both love numbers. A CPA and an, an economy, major, uh, you know, economics major. Those are great skill sets to have. And 
you know, for someone like me that doesn't particularly love the numbers, I've got a CPA on my staff as well and, and on my team. And, you know, it really makes a difference. Let me ask you this. Who handles your operations? Like you said, you self-manage, which I love hearing, uh, you know, that I'm a big proponent for that. But who, who handles that piece? Do you guys share that role or do you carve that up somehow? I would say that it is shared by uh, my brother who does the real estate economic side. Okay. He's pretty good at operations and writing out our operations manual and putting in systems in place so that we don't have to repeat them, building apps to help with turn, cut turnover days down by one or two days. He does a lot of that. And then also the um, CPA, his name is Coleman. He does the asset management role. So he's overseeing our staff. We have on staff, staff maintenance tech, on staff uh, manager. So he is dealing with them on the day to day where uh, my brother is putting in the systems to help him do that. So it's kind of a tag team, but they have different responsibilities within that tag team. Love it. Very impressive. Uh, you know, guys, those of you listening, you have to, every, every business out there is, is, is just two things. It's people and systems. And the fact that you guys just, I mean, I know, I know you're at, what, what was it? Uh, you're at 77 units or something like that right now. Is that right? Yeah. And that's yeah. Right. And, and for you guys just to have 77 units and to already be thinking along those lines, putting the systems in place, that's just brilliant. And, yeah. and uh, really says a lot about, uh, you know, you guys are going to be rock stars in this business. There's no question uh, based on what I'm hearing. And it sounds like you've got great complimenting energy. So, and I, you know, I could tell from your ability to communicate, I, I, I assume there was some sales background in there because you're a great communicator. So back to those guys that are sitting there and haven't done anything yet. Again, what would you tell them? Well, I think I always preach that time is the most valuable asset, right? And, okay. Uh, although mark, a lot of markets are very hot, I think now is the time to do it um, because, you know, even more than capital, time is going to build wealth. So now is the time to do it. Make the jump, jump into the fire, and you'll figure it out along the way. It's the best way to learn. Uh, for me, like I love listening to audiobooks and podcasts and all that stuff. I, I get nuggets out of them. But until you're thrown into the fire and learning it in the real world, you, it doesn't stick the same way. Uh, to totally agree. Well, listen, uh, I really appreciate you being on the show. You added a tremendous amount of value, Jared, and I can tell you and your group are going places and I'm excited to see where you're at a year or two from now. And uh, we will put your contact information in the show notes. And uh, thanks for being on the show, my friend. No, I appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. I've been listening for a long time, so it's my pleasure to be on the show. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you for listening to the Lifetime Cash Flow through Real Estate Investing Podcast. If you've enjoyed the show, please subscribe and then take a moment to visit iTunes and leave a five-star rating and review. For more resources to connect with us further, please visit our website at lifetimecashflowpodcast.com. Tune in next week for our next show.